Welcome. Welcome, everyone. This is uh, Drive Time, UCLA Anderson, the Drive Time podcast. This is our 80th episode. My name is Dylan Stafford. I'm your host, and uh, I'm thrilled. This is kind of an experiment recording these with actual guests, and our guest <laughs> is Rob, and we're grateful to have you here today, Rob. Yeah. And I would love to introduce um, Stephen Johnson, whose picture you see here, and let me just turn that off so you can see his face more easily. Um, Stephen Johnson has been on my wish list. Um, you know, we have 900 current students and philosophically, I'd love to interview everyone. Obviously, pragmatically, that's not possible. So I keep what I call my wish list. And Stephen has been on my wish list for over two years. He's a recent grad, but he got on my wish list during the program when he, uh, he said, oh, by the way, I just published my book, Small Beginnings. Oh, wow require bigger dreams. That's what I said. I was a big, oh, wow, because um, to maintain one's career and go to graduate school in the evenings and the weekend is pretty successful in absorbing every minute of free time out of a person's life. You become a time management ninja when you go through the FEMBA program. And so not many people publish a book. <laughs> so Stephen got on my radar back then. And, um, and, you know, life is busy and here we are, and I'm just thrilled to, to share his story today. He's a double, double Bruin. And by that, I mean, he went here undergrad where he earned a, a BS in microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics. And then, you know, went away and worked for a while and came back and earned his, his fully employed MBA degree a few years later. So that's one way he's a double Bruin, but he's a double, double Bruin, use the in and out metaphor of a double double because he also met his future wife while he was studying here. And together they have a family with not two children and not one child and not three children, but four children. So you start to see why um, Steven stuck out to me as, as a unicorn and a person who had a really interesting story. But wait, there's more. He's also an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship is I always think it's the icing on the cake, it's our special sauce, it's our secret recipe. Um, it's that special flavor of Southern California, of California, I guess, overall, San Francisco Bay Area down to here. Um, and I never know, you know what percentage of people are entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs aspiring. Maybe five to 12%-ish, maybe kind of, sort of. Um, but Stephen is both the founder of Emeon Capital and the founder of Bright Minds Tutoring. So um, for all of those reasons, it's a lot to unpack <laughs> as we were talking yesterday. Stephen, I'm never going to let you speak until right now when, uh, with no further ado and with, with much gratitude to have you as our, as our feature here, our featured guest, um, you know, welcome and, and thanks for your time in advance, Stephen. Of course. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here with you, Dylan. Uh, you know, talking about me being on your wish list for two years. Every time I see you, I have such pleasant memories of my first time on camp, like returning to campus when I was deciding that, hey, maybe I want to get an MBA. Um, we'll get into like at what point in my in my story that all happened. But you were one of the first people to greet me. And um, we had a great we had a great time with a panel discussion with, with, with current FIMBA students on, up on stage. And the impact and the impression that you made and the other students made, it's like I walked out of there knowing I'm going to apply here. I'm going to like this is somehow, some way I need to be around people like this. Right. So you are a big part of that. So, again, thank you for, for having me. Oh, oh, my goodness. All right. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yes. So, so yes, as, as Dylan mentioned, my name is Stephen Johnson. Um, so I, I am a double brew and I, I, I was pre-med in undergrad and I'm originally from Los Angeles. So I was born and raised here in LA, raised by my mother and my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was an entrepreneur in a time when black women were not really, uh, you know, didn't really do that on a larger scale. She, she ran a large beauty salon or very successful beauty salon and wig shop in the historic West Adams area of, of Los Angeles. My mother uh, had me when she was a teenager, she was in high school. So I was actually born five days before my mom's 17th birthday, right? So hmm. with that came a lot of, a lot of uh, dominoes uh, are affected by, by that type of uh, happening in such a young person's life. Um, so my mom was also very smart, top of her class, was headed to college at uh, Cal State Northridge and to be pre-med 
and within the first semester dropped out to make sure she could take care of me and, and you know be there for myself. Um, so a lot of what I see in me, definitely I gleaned from both my mom's experience and my grandmother's experience, and of course having my own unique um, experiences throughout life. But I wanted to just honor them at, this, at the outset because I recognize that everything else that I talk about today really came from the work ethic that I learned from them, from those two strong women in my life. Um, and you know, I just want everything I do is pretty, is pretty much to honor them at this point. So after that, right, kind of you know taking you through the story with me, uh, I grew up in LA, always had UCLA as my dream school. And I remember being in high school and would you know, take the bus just to walk on campus, just to get a sense of how it felt. Uh, when I applied to UCLA, it was the only school I applied to, something that most people don't know. I was, uh, you know, I was very stubborn. Uh, yeah, people <laughs> advised to not do that. <laughs> yeah, spread, spread out your spread out your uh, investment options a little yeah. bit. <laughs> but you know, at that time, it was you know that was just just who I was, and in some ways, it's who I am today. Once I get my mind set on something, it's mm. really hard to push me off of where my mind is set. And I'm not afraid of failure. In which case, you know, if I don't get what I want on the first try. I'm going to keep going after it, and I, I, I believe eventually I will get it. So I got to UCLA. I studied microbiology, like Dylan mentioned, and I thought that I was on a path to become a research scientist. Like, that was it. I was going to get an MD, PhD, and work in clinical research. As a student at UCLA, I worked in a research lab uh, studying gene therapy. Great time there. It really enjoyed things. And then it was almost as if all of a sudden, it just wasn't the right thing for me anymore, and I can't I still cannot, and this is, you know, 15 years ago at this point, put my finger on what exactly happened. Hmm. But it's almost like, you know, you, you hear people say, I caught the entrepreneurial bug. It really did feel like that. Um, I remember watching something on CNBC one day, and there was something that was said about, uh, you know, some, you know, it was like an acquisition or mergers and acquisition that day. Like some big thing was in the news and everybody was excited about it. And it's like, oh, I, I like that feeling. I just wanted to have that feeling of, of not having a ceiling on what I could become in my life. And maybe that's the best concise way to put it. In science, it's like I knew the steps. I knew the path. Okay, get my bachelor's degree. Okay, maybe work in a research lab and do like a post-baccalaureate type of thing. Uh, get into a PhD program, go into med school. I, everything's kind of planned out. You know what's going to happen. You know it's difficult. You know you have to put a lot of effort into it. But you pretty much know like the next 10, 15, 20 years, maybe longer of what your life will look like. And that no longer was exciting for me. I was like, I prefer to not know. I prefer to kind of launch out into the deep, as they say, uh, take that leap of faith and believe in myself, which is truly, I think, you know, the origin story for every entrepreneur, right? It's, I don't know what's going to happen, but I believe I can make it happen somehow. Um, so my first, my very first business was actually a catering company, which is another thing that most people do not know. I was an undergrad at UCLA my senior year, and I started catering these huge events, 300 people, 400 people, 500 people. My, my now wife, my girlfriend at the time, Noemi, um, who was a psychology major at UCLA, I was driving her crazy because we'd be in this small, tiny kitchen trying to cook food for, you know, 500 people. <laughs> and, you know, somehow we'd pull it off. <laughs> and at the end, she would always say, I'm never going to do that again, right? Like, I hope you never do this again. Um, and to me, it just energized me, like every experience like that of like, okay, I need to figure this out. I, I don't know how this is going to work, but I need to figure it out. Each of those experiences truly energized me and made me feel alive. Um, and once I felt that, I realized I wasn't getting that same feeling from science. As much as I loved it, there was like an intellectual stimulation there. There was this idea of maybe I'm going to help someone in the future if we go to clinical trials with what we're doing here. But like I needed that just reinforcement of like I can have a vision for myself and somehow, some way, you know, against all odds, make it make it happen for myself. So um, at some point, as I was deciding whether or not I'd become a full time entrepreneur, I'm working in a science lab. So this is kind of the, the crazy story that I think gives context to what Dylan mentioned about like being a FEMBA, you know, being a parent of four, being married, writing a book. Um, I am mid twenties, 23 or so. And I wake up at 4.30 every morning. I get to my lab at, at this point, I'm, I'm post-graduation. I'm working at Cedar sinai Medical Center in a, another gene therapy research lab. I'm getting into the laboratory at 6 a.m. every morning, 
you know, no one else shows up until 10 a.m. So I get four hours of complete peace to work with my <laughs> cells and my viruses and my bacteria. <laughs> and like, I go, you know, I'm completely zoned, like zenned out there and doing my thing. And then at 2.30 p.m., I would leave there and rush onto the freeway to get to my tutoring clients, right? Because after school time is when that's when that business kind of started. So I work with kids from 3 p.m. until 8, 9 p.m. at night. And then I do catering on weekends, right? So I was kind of putting all that together while I'm trying to you know, foster the relationship with my, my you know, again, my then girlfriend who became my wife soon after and thinking about life, regular life stuff. Like, well, when we buy a house and how are we gonna get married? How are we gonna do all these things with planning the future that we have together? But again, at the end of the day, it always energized me. It never made me feel like, oh, I'm doing too much or this is not sustainable. I always felt like this is what I want my life to feel like. Um, so fast forward, I finally did leave the world of science. I realized that I wasn't getting the joy out of that that I had once received from it. And I went full time into the education business. I stopped the catering company. So I was full time in the education business for really 10 years. I've uh, got a, a wonderful opportunity to work with kids of all different backgrounds, different economic situations, you know, kids in public schools, private schools, really a, a well-rounded opportunity to meet people, to develop relationships with people throughout the city. And about, you know, at this point, four years ago, I decided, hey, I want more. I want to go back to school and I want to get an MBA. Um, and the, the thing that I think caused that shift for me to decide, hey, there's, some, there's something more for me, is as I, just, as I started to think about, well, what, what do I, where do I want to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? Everything's mm -hmm. good right now, right? Again, back to even what I was saying about the science, like that, when you're in medicine or in the science field, everything is kind of planned out, right? So when I jumped off of that path, it really was day to day, right? Like everything was day to day. <laughs> Wow. Well, you go from a 20 year horizon to a 12 hour horizon. Exactly. Exactly. It really did feel like that. Like my head is down in the weeds. This is my business. If I fail, like there's no one, there's no HR to go to. There's no, <laughs> there's no boss to say, I need a time, I need a day off to recoup. Like it is truly on me. So with that came this mindset of just get the work done, put your head down and focus. And, you know, after 10 years and having a lot of success with that business, Fortunately, I was in a position to think about future, right? And think about, well, is this something that I want to do forever? Do mm -hmm. I want to do it in this way forever? Um, what else am I interested in? And the more I thought about it, I realized that the things that I wanted long-term, which we'll get into in a few minutes, I didn't have the skill. I didn't really have the skill set for it. I felt I had the aptitude for it. I know that I can learn pretty easily. I can, I'm a hard worker. Those things are important, but I didn't, I didn't feel like I had the network for it. There's no one I could go speak to, to ask questions, to say, how do you, you know, what is consulting like? What is, you know, re, uh, real estate development like? I didn't have those things in my network. And I felt like going back to Anderson and specifically and getting an MBA would give me that opportunity to build out friendships and relationships. And I'm so glad that I made that decision. Um, you know, right when I made the decision, my wife and I were expecting twins. So that's two of the four that we have. And, you know, when I, I remember telling my mom, you know, I'm going to go back to school. It's like, <laughs> you're expecting twins. Well, you know, this is, this is 2018, like maybe February, they were due March of 2018. And there, again, there was just something in me that said, if you don't do this now, you're probably not going to have another opportunity to do so. Um, fortunately, my wife doesn't need to, you know, check into a, you know, traditional job. Um, so she's home and it's like, well, you know, the kids, you know, when they're little, you know, they're easy to, to watch and to, to keep contained. And if I, <laughs> if I can get this MBA within the next three years, right, it can really set me up for helping or for, for achieving the vision that I have for my life long term and for my family's life more importantly, long-term. And again, I'm so glad that I made that decision because now post-graduation from Anderson, I've been able to launch my own um, investment firm. Um, I've been able to pivot actually my educational business, which is something that, you know, I don't know if I, maybe I would have thought of it prior, you know, without the MBA, but definitely the classes and the, the people that I was surrounded by helped me to think about scale in a different way than I had been thinking about before. Um, and that's really been helpful for me. 
And it, it just puts me in a position again with, I have, now I do have people that I can go speak to, right? I have friends, mm. classmates that I can call on the phone and say, what do you think about this? You know, or what are you doing? Or how can I, how can I help with what you're doing? Or how can you help with what I'm doing? Um, whether it be marketing or strategy or advisory, whatever it may be. And that is something that I'm so, again, just back to the gratitude with, you know, meeting Dylan that day and just, just deciding to be in that room that day. I'm so glad looking back on it that I decided to do that. Um, so yeah, that's, that is a little bit about me. There's a lot more, obviously, within those 10 years of entrepreneurship in between leaving science and getting to Anderson. But I think the overall message that I wanted to kind of present about myself is, you know, nothing's impossible, right? And Dylan mentioned becoming a, a what did you say? A, what, a, a ninja. You said a, a oh, time a, management a ninja, right? Like, so yeah, absolutely right. And I felt like the benefit that I had personally was I had already developed that particular skill before I got to Anderson. Well, the 4.30 launch and the 6 a.m. arrival and the four hours of Zen. And yeah, yeah. Those, are, those, are, those are work habits many people don't have in their early 20s. Right, right. Yeah. Out of necessity, it's like I needed, my mantra at that time was do it all, right? My mind was, you know, well, just Stephen, just choose one out of the three things. And, and it's just like, no, just do it all. Do it all, figure out how you can make it all work. And yeah, that's that again, that skill set to be able to time manage and still have peace of mind and still be happy about what you're doing um, was very beneficial for me. Well, let me, you know, so much good stuff in there. And, and you know, the kind of my my metaphor for these drive time is, you know, share success so you can drive change, right? Picking on two of our three pillars of Anderson's culture that share success, we're a, we're a handshakes to hugs kind of place. And and drive change that ultimately there's a there's a confidence that goes with graduate school in general and there's a confidence that goes with an MBA in specific to you know and it's that combination like I heard you say you know now I had people to ask I wasn't necessarily just winging it now when I made a pivot it was an informed pivot now I'm I'm thinking about elements of scale and and there's maybe a, a more sophisticated post MBA approach contrasted with my pre MBA brute force <laughs> you know i this shall be you know just uh -huh. you, you didn't say what did you you didn't say not just do it but do it all yeah. um but one one thing like i just wanted to ask because i think it's so to me inspiring i'm, I'm a father of two and uh I'm, I'm grateful as can be um and you know and then our biology said that's all you're going to get so we you know we got what we you get what you get you don't get upset but you know, it's such, I, especially working with many Fembas who are at that fiance becoming significant other spouse, um, married with no kids, becoming married with kids. You know, those, those are such stair steps. You know, did, did you and your wife, you know, did you guys sit down and do a pro con? Like as a, as a partnership, and, and this is an MBA, this is a degree in management, which is working with and through the time and talents of those around me to maximum benefit to all involved. Like, how did you all, how did you all decide? Because my goodness, with twins on the way, I mean, you know, it's one thing when it's just, I'm going to work hard, but it's another thing when there are little people dependent on you, you know, like anything about how you all made that decision and how that's part of how you, you know, manage, because like you are your own boss, right? Like you report to you and your wife, I guess, you know, philosophically, right? And so that's, exciting, but it's also maybe terrifying, you know, when, when there are people who depend on you. So I just, if you say anything about that. Um, I think that's an excellent question. And I have to, first of all, start out with saying how grateful I am for my wife, right? I, I, you hear it said, uh, you know, who you are in relationship with matters quite a bit. Um, and in this particular case, you know, because of the history that we had, right? So we've been married for, it'll be um, 13 years this September. Wow. So, you know, going into business school, what, that's four years ago. So that was, we're nine years in to our, you know, eight and a half years into our, into our marriage. And I, we knew each other prior to getting married. So, you know, when I sat down and said, Hey, this is what I'm thinking of doing. It wasn't a, a huge surprise. <laughs> <laughs> that's was, she, right. she does know the merchandise pretty well at this point. Right. Oh, really? Yeah. Tell me more. Right. 
so you know, and to be more practical, so we did sit down, we did talk about it, and so well, what would that, what would that look like, right? So it wasn't really a pro con in terms of like financial or you know what will this mean post for you. It really was you know how will our lives look if you're doing it this way, right? So the FEMBA program in particular became extremely like extremely valuable to have because if we were, if I was doing full time, I don't know if I could have made it work. Right, because you know the flexibility and timing and all that. So, you know, our conversation was around, "Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I set my own time. But if I'm going to have class, you know, a couple times a week, you know, when would you prefer that I have classes, honey? Right. Mm-hmm. So, should I do weekends or should I do Tuesday and Thursdays? Right. So, I'm involving her with the decision making on how will this impact our life. Right. If I'm not here on Tuesday and Thursday nights, that means you're doing bedtime by yourself, like you're doing dinner by yourself, right? Very, very, very practical things. So once she was on, once we're aligned with how the life will look and how, you know, it, it, everything will be smooth and everything will be okay. It was it, you know, really, that was all it took. Um, that's really all was all it took. Because again, like I said earlier, it's hard to get me like, you know, once I'm on to something, it's hard to get me off of it. Um, and she's again to her bit to you know to her credit and to my benefit when she notices that about me she's very supportive and i'm very grateful for that oh that's awesome that is awesome and, and did you choose the tuesday thursday schedule tuesday so yes because of my yeah the one we said hey tuesday thursday is best it's only two nights out of the week we still get you for weekends right yeah so so yeah all the saturday morning yeah and sunday morning and yeah okay yeah yeah, so that's that's what worked out for us. Very good, very good. Well, you know, do you want to kind of segue forward, or I have I have a list of questions, but you know, I also want you know. Sure, I mean, is, yeah, I think you know, I don't know if there's any questions in the audience, but sure, if you have more questions, the only other thing that I was really prepared to talk about was kind of um, you know this idea around op- like what types of opportunities are out there post graduation. Yeah, I love it. I love it. The kind of the what's next. You know, yeah. and, you know, because I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to have a slightly different approach on, you know, some of this. I'm not going to I don't think of it through like, a you know, what type of job opportunities are there necessarily. But, you know, I think that when I think about the, the speed at which technology is moving and you kind of think about, you know, forward thinking, I'm always forward thinking, like, you know, 10, 20 years from now, what, where will artificial intelligence be? Where will virtual reality be? Where? will robotics be right um it's it's thinking about how do you retool yourself as a as a person as a human being and the mba program for me the fimba program in particular really helped me to retool and so everything that i said earlier about i took inventory on where am i what do i want what is it i want to accomplish what do i envision for myself in the future and then really be honest about okay how can i do that right what am i missing right Oh, I'm missing network. I'm missing understanding of finance. I'm missing understanding of you know these things. Okay, where can I go get that? Sure, I could get it by you know googling on my own, and I can you know kind of piece together this little piece, this piecemeal sense of education. But for me, it made more sense. I wanted to be surrounded and inundated with other people who are also learning these things and surrounded by this community of people um, who are on a similar path. And you know, when I look at opportunities in the future, it's really kind of the same. I think of it in the same way, right? So any student who's considering an MBA, who's considering whatever they're considering, a law degree, a, you know, an engineering degree, it's not for where you are today, but really for where you want to be in the future, right? And so you have to take inventory on where where is our society headed, and how can I be of service to that society, right? How can I be of service? to that reality that we're, that we're headed into. Um, and the more of service I can be, then the more uh, you know, marketable, to use a business term, the more marketable I am, right? And we all, you know, I think most people who are, th- who are looking at MBAs want to make money. They want to have you know, whatever their definition of success is in life. Um, they wanna be happy as we all do, right? And we take this opportunity to educate ourselves and to learn and to network and to build relationships with people with that as the aim, right? So the opportunities I think are immense for people to just to retool, right? The, the world's changing very fast. And that's the best word I can use is just retooling kind of our thought process, right? Will the industries of today look the same way in 20 years? Probably not. <laughs> right. um, if, you, if we know that, then what can you do now that kind of is a hedge against that so that the dreams that you have for your life and for your family can still be accomplished Right. So how do you hedge that now by educating yourself 
and building out your network. You know, I love the observation you had about, you know, I could piecemeal this, I could give myself a Google education, you know, with a smidgen of this and a dash of that. And I can also choose to have a curated journey, right? Like, like these 20, you take 20 classes here. So these 20 faculty have all spent two decades becoming experts in their respective fields, and they can sift through a lot. You know, we have access to every thing that's ever been written by every great thinker ever <laughs> in any language. Amen. Okay, well, that's useful, but that's a lot to digest. So I love the idea of, of you know, giving yourself the, the partnership with a curated journey. You know, how, like as an entrepreneur, because you were an entrepreneur before, some people become, I love, you know, catch the entrepreneurial bug. You caught it in undergrad. Don't quite know when, but, you know, sitting here, I'm a scientist and I'm cooking in my kitchen for 500 people. <laughs> Better a lot of my other scientist buddies are not doing this and haven't talked their girlfriend into helping them. You know, so you don't, you don't remember a Genesis moment, but there was this evolution into, and I loved how you said, I wanted entrepreneurship. I, I didn't want to have a limit. You know, even with the wonderfulness of the two decades to become a PhD MD, there's still kind of a, a boundedness to that. And, and you were saying, wow, you know, when I listen to these entrepreneurs, there was this energy about that. And I wanted that. How, how do you, how is your entrepreneurial vision impacted by, by the, by the MBA? Like, how do you see, and, and you've already kind of started to speak about it, looking into the future, industries of the future, but yeah, like, where do you, do you ever notice like, oh my God, I just had an MBA thought or, or is it more just kind of baked in now? Yeah. You know what? That's a great question. And I think that, you know, you mentioned something earlier with regard to, you know, flying by the seat of your pants mm. and there is some sense of, you know, well, there's like multiple camps of entrepreneurship, but there is a camp of entrepreneurship, which is really the just go do it camp. Sure. Right? Don't analyze and you're like paralysis by analysis. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. So just get out there, do it as you go. You will learn as you have customers, you will learn from them. You will get feedback and you just keep iterating, 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 iterating. And eventually all those iterations lead to success. And sure. that's definitely the camp that I was in. And to some degree, I'm still in that camp, right? It's like a, you know, go for it. Don't stop. Um, so the MBA slowed me down and it was an intentional slowing down because again, mm -hmm. taking inventory prior to, I realized, I don't know how, how you know, really the thought is, I don't know if I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm totally interrupting your flow. I'm just interrupting your flow. I just, it's just, you said the MBA slowed me down and you said it fast because you are, I'm like, excuse me, I'm about to get <laughs> scatological with my Southernness. Sorry, but I'm, I'm just laughing because it's like four kids couldn't slow me down. <laughs> you know, like It took, you know, so I, that's just, that's fat, you know, like you actually consciously put yourself into a different speed after having been at a very accelerated speed for a decade. So that's even kind of courageous because if nothing else, you could out hustle anybody in the room. So it's, I'm sorry, back to you. I just had yeah, to underline it was, that. It was, very, it was very intentional. And even, you know, funny story, when I got to campus, you know, you're hearing about all the different clubs. I joined maybe 10 clubs, Dylan. Oh, you did. <laughs> of course you did. And, of course you and, did. You know, I'm sitting there one day, I'm getting all these emails and, you know, we have this on this day and this on that day. And I said, no, I'm doing it again. Slow down. The reason why you're here is to learn, yes, but it's also to like, ha take a moment for yourself. Right? Take a moment for yourself and be patient. And if you're running so fast, you can't see all of what's going on, right? Your mm -hmm. view of life is very different when you're running quickly than when you're walking. Just that's a fact of life, right? So I was using the MBA program to slow myself down. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, again, so grateful that I, that I did. So what's, what's a benefit that I've gotten from that slowing down process for myself is now when I see opportunities, I see it from so many different angles. Because the entrepreneur that's all go, 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 it's a very linear, very uh, tunnel visioned way of life. And it has value at some points, um, but at some points it doesn't have value. Okay. So I think that I, so then the, is it baked in? Yes. Because that's just kind of the, that's the type of learner that I am, right? I remember when I first um, started the MBA program, I was talking to, uh, you know, recent alum 
they say, oh, well, I'm working in this industry and I have, I will go back to my notes from class in order to bring it to my, to, you know, to my colleagues. And like, it was this interaction between real, like, this is exactly what I learned in class. And now I can take that exact lesson into the, into the workplace. And I was really envied that saying, I've never been that type of person, right? I just kind of absorb and make it part of me. And I move forward with that, like new version of me. Okay. So the new version of Steven as an entrepreneur is the person who's more thoughtful about which direction do I want to take? Not just go, just not just go. Um, and I really attribute that to the MBA. Well, t tell us about Emion Capital. Like how, what, what's your, you know, what's your vision for your, for that part of your entrepreneurial portfolio? Yeah. So <clears throat> the vision for Emion Capital is to invest in underrepresented founders um, who are building the future for education and for and for biotechnology, right? So you take these two experiences of my of my history that I've already kind of gone through, and I look at that and say, okay, well, I've had all this experience. What can, what else can I do with it, right? How how can I, as I get older, right? Again, thinking twenty years, I don't feel like I'm old today, but I will be old, right? So how do how do I what what type of person do I want to be when I'm sixty or seventy years old, right? I want to be able to say. Hey, I, I was a scientist. I was an entrepreneur or am an entrepreneur. I created an educational company. How do I give th the learnings from those experiences to the next generation of people who are coming up and looking to make change in the world through, through those same industries? So Emion is the house for the investment portfolio into companies that are doing just that. Oh, that's fantastic. Another, another uh, plug, I guess, for Anderson. Two of two of the companies I've invested in are Anderson alum. Um, really? I've only invested in three companies. All three are Bruins. Uh, the other was an engineering. Uh, he, has, he has a master's in engineering from UCLA. Um, so, yeah, the relationships there, you know, these all these things really matter quite a bit. Um, yeah. Very, very grateful. Well, I, can't say, I can't say it enough. <laughs> oh, well, and now I want to, if, if Josh or Rob would like to ask a question, I want to give them a second to think about their question, but I just want to put a plug in for partnership and this double Bruin idea. You know, my, it's, you know, one of my best friends at work is Bonnie Kim, who's the other assistant dean. And several things, uh, teaching um, the Stand and Deliver course, this, this podcast, she's such a, um, she, I, I, I joke she should be my agent or something, you know, she should get 10% of all the zero dollars that I've earned so far. But she's, she's just one of those work colleagues who's so empowering and inspiring. And one of her observations, even about these interviews is she, she likes to point out, Dylan, these interviews are way bigger than Femba. They're way bigger than Anderson. And so I just, you know, like, I love, you know, you drop the pebble in the pond and where do the ripples stop? Well, it depends how big the pond is and and how many pebbles you drop and how still the water is and how 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 receptive that particular body of water was to that to that stimulation and i'm just all touched like wow you have invested in three clients so far we were talking yesterday when we were prepping like if i interview you 20 years from now when you're you know big man not that you're not a large man already because four children i'll never forget you know you're already on the court fully participating in the journey of life from whatever your starting point was no excuses you know i'm going to build my path forward and you've you but it's so exciting you know like i don't know 20 years from now you got 30 clients and a couple of them were unicorns and they you know they they did what they did and it's all you know kind of lazy chair you know grandpa <laughs> sunday afternoon let me tell you a story about when i was just getting started Stop you know, that. versus like right now, wow, three Bruins are being sourced by your commitment that that could be. And that's just like, the world needs more people doing stuff like that. Yes, uh, you said, a, you said a few things that dogs my mind, um, to just internal thoughts and internal processes that I that I have. Uh, so you know, you said something that made me think about a thought that I had right before starting school, which was, you know, I started off, you know, with small beginnings, as the book title says, single mom, you know, grandmother was there to help, father wasn't in my life, he's around, well, you know, I knew him, thank God, he didn't know his father, but he, you know, he wasn't around, he wasn't in the house, and we, I grew up in the inner city, uh, very, very poor, you know, again, not to go into all of that, but that was, that was my beginning, and my path from that beginning 
led me into this great life that I could have never truly imagined when I was younger. But the, here it is. I'm living this life day to day. And at one point, I felt like I was a large fish in a small pond. And that thought kind of terrorized me for a minute. It's like, huh, this life that feels so great. And maybe this is part of my own psychosis. Who knows? A psychologist can tell me <laughs> whether this is a good thing or healthy or not healthy. So I'm not judging it. It's just this was the facts for me. And so the thought that, hey, I, you know, this is great, but what's, what's, what's the pond that I'm in? How many people, where are my limitations? How, where am I capped out at? Where's the ceiling for me in this life that is way better than I grew up with? Mm -hmm. but we're here, like, you know, it's still, it's still limited in some way. So another, you know, another part of the getting into, in, into the MBA program is like, I want to be around, I want to jump into the ocean, right? I want to be in a larger pool of water. I rather, I'd rather be in a larger pool and I'm okay with becoming a small fish. I'm completely okay with becoming the small fish. So I, you know, I, I focused on finance at Anderson. I have no finance background. Um, most classes, I had no idea what was going on the first couple of weeks. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a humbling experience. You're sitting there and you feel smart and you feel accomplished. And I've done all this and I've done all that. Right. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Um, because in that moment, you're the small fish. And I really learned to love that experience. Um, mm. Anderson helped me to really love that experience because, wow, by the end of those classes, you knew so you may not be the top of the class, but you knew so much more than you did when you started. And that's a beautiful like trajectory. Right. So the, as many times as I can. So even with my fund, I didn't know anything about a fund when I started Anderson. I didn't know about investing in startups. I didn't know about angel investing, but it was like, OK, so I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a small fish in a huge, huge ocean of venture capital and billions of dollars sloshing around the country. And I'm gonna become this like small fish in that pond and I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna observe and I'm gonna meet people and I'm gonna, you know, like this is this is my self-talk. Mm -hmm. This is my self-talk, right? And, you know, again, Anderson became a huge tool for that. And, you know, as I move forward for the rest of my life as being, as being a part of the alumni network and just like even just the personal taking aways from that experience, I think will serve me forever. There's no dollar amount I could put on that experience, right? And what that kind of births in me. So yeah, thank you for saying what you said. It really made me think about a lot of the, like the, in, you know, the, the real time, like sitting at my, sitting at the desk with, you know, taking finance classes and being like, I really, I'm walking out having no idea <laughs> what I just heard uh, and I need to go home and sorry, honey, I, you know, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to connect tonight and I'm not going to, you know, I, I need to spend a few hours and go over this material and make sure I got it. Well, part of my commitment with these interviews is to, to, you know, like competencies can be developed, skills can be learned. And so like uh, there's three that I, that I hear you, you've, you've always had a love of education that's consistent through your journey. Um, you've always had this kind of, I'll call it the 4:30 AM work ethic. And then, and so those are two, those are two, like though anybody, you could be tall or short, doesn't matter your genetics, you know, like you can, you can love education just because you choose to love education and you can be hardworking because you choose to get out of bed in the morning. So, most human beings have access to those two. And then this, this third one that you just illuminated of, I don't know, educational humility or something like, you know, like being willing to place yourself into a, into an alien conversation. Cause yeah, finance, I mean, all of the disciplines in an MBA, if you go deep down the rabbit hole, it gets, you know, really jargon rich acronym filled really quickly. And you can tell the guys who were finance undergrad and who've been on the street, you can tell those guys. And then you can tell I was a history major with a finance concentration at Chicago feeling like, yeah, you know, and, and I wish like this is one of my, you know, my top three regrets from my MBA was I never took Eugene Fama. I chickened out, you know, I just I was like, you know, everybody said, oh, he's really hard. And I, and I was like a little grade snob. You know, nobody's ever asked for my MBA GPA once. But I was, that's just, you know, I was a grade snob slash insecure, <laughs> not a great combination. You know, would it have been better to get out of there with a bunch of A's and B's and my one C that I got in economics? Or would it have been better to and know Eugene Fama, who later won the Nobel Prize? 
Or by contrast, would it have been better to get out of there with two C's? <laughs> but the second C would have been from a future Nobel Prize winner. So, you know, I'm, I'm just, your story inspires me on six different levels, right? And you said it earlier, like everybody, it's okay, want to make money. And, you know, however much a, each individual wants to make, that's a different definition of success. Everybody's got their own definition of success. But this is a degree for people who want to go make something happen, who maybe want to remove a, the perception of a ceiling that does exist. Because this is a skeleton key. This degree will open all kinds of doors, but it's, it's not automatic. And so these are a whole bunch of words to say, if you're listening to this, you know, as we get this post-produced and out there, you know, yeah, I love education. I'm willing to put out some effort and, and I'm going to consciously put myself into environments that are uncomfortable, but that's what I'm paying for. You know, I, I've just always had an inkling about in, entrepreneurship. I've always had an intuition about finance or real estate or entertainment or whatever, whatever, whatever. So future grad students hearing this recording in the future, you know, well, yeah, Stephen must just have better genetics than me. You know, yeah, well, we can say that about anybody who's awesome, but that's not really super empowering, right? All extraordinary people are ordinary people who started out from an ordinary spot, but then they, they developed work habits that were more useful and those compounded through time. And so that's what I wanted to underline from yeah, well, that's that's the title of the book. Small beginnings require bigger dreams, right? I titled it that way because it really wants to encapsulate. It doesn't matter where you start, but it does matter. What it, what does matter is how big can you think, and how much how big can you believe in yourself? And you know, some things I'll never maybe I'll never become the biggest best venture capitalist in the world, and that's not that doesn't matter to me, right? It's the fact that I can believe that it, it's possible. And I can get on the path to getting there and getting, you know, doing what I want to do. Um, that brings me joy in my life. And that at the end of the day, is all I want is to be happy and to support my family. I love, you know, I love the first quote. I love the middle quote that I read you yesterday. What would you do with your life if you genuinely believed that you were unstoppable? Like, you know, that's an audacious thing to say. But what is it that prevents us from being our own champion? You know, like that's we have access to being kind to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I think it starts off with realizing that there are doubts in our consciousness that are put there, um, for lack of a better word, by people in some in most cases who really do care about us, including our parents, including our communities. Um, and it's not to judge, well, why did you tell me this and you held me back? It's, it's just, well, does that serve me? Does that serve who I am today? Does that serve who I want to be? And if it doesn't, all right, I have some, I have some work to do. It's not going to magically happen. But if there truly is this dream inside of me that is great and grand and fantastic and amazing and big, and I'm living in mediocrity and just, you know, paycheck to paycheck or, you know, whatever, whatever that reality may be for you. Um, can I think, Hey, why do I have the dream? Like, why is a dream there? Maybe it's there for a reason, Like, maybe I should listen to it. Maybe I should maybe believe it's possible, um, and start there and to see what happens. I'm reading, you know, page 123. Sometimes our ambitions for massive growth can cause us to get stuck in waiting for that big break. Oh yeah and blind us to the power of cumulative growth. Like, that's what I love about your story. You know, like, just put your shoulder on the boulder and start pushing it uphill. One day, Tuesday, Wednesday, right. Thursday, <laughs> right. you know, and this one, you know, and this, this one, the storyteller in me, you know, your very first one on page three, tell your story, mm -hmm. face the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's all yours. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, where'd you, Get all this stuff because <laughs> it's good stuff. Is this all from your grandma? Is she gonna? Is she a ghostwriter? Is it from your mom? You know, like I love it. Yeah, no ghostwriters, but um, you know, you and I share a common a common experience in that we both have parents who were pastors. My mom mm. was a pastor. Um, she, you know, so there's a there's a big part of my life that is rooted in spirituality, and that root for me really is 
something that inspires me to believe more than you know what I see, right? This idea of having faith, like the the idea of faith itself is mm -hmm. you believe something that you can't physically see right in front of your eyes. So that was definitely how I was raised. And it was really, you know, as I get older and think about it, um, I'm again, so grateful to my mom for doing that because the reality that we had growing up, if I was stuck on what I could see where, you know, I don't know where I'd be right now, right? And this is what gives me empathy for people who are from the same communities that I'm from, who involve themselves in things that are, you know, not productive for their lives. It's very easy to get stuck on, well, this is how, you know, look at my community, look at my house, look at the policing situation in my community, look at, you know, look at all, look at the lack of opportunities, look at the lack of education. And for us, for myself and my siblings, from, from my mother and from my grandmother, the idea or the message was always look beyond that. Like, can you see yourself beyond that? Can you see yourself, you know, through, like, can you see yourself uh, uh, overcoming those obstacles? They're just obstacles in the way. They're not like your destined reality. Um, they're just little obstacles in the way that you can get over and through and under and however way, right? So a lot of, a lot, and that's why I started off the conversation with, I have to give honor to them, right? Because everything that I've discussed in this time and every, any person who speaks to me, like this is a Stephen that you get. Um, so the friends and, you know, that, that we have great conversations. It's all of it comes from that, from that foundation, from my mother, the teenage mom who said, I can still, you know, the single teenage mom who said, I can still raise great kids and we can have a great life. And I don't know how it's gonna happen, but I believe it's possible. The grandmother who moved to Los Angeles from New York in the, you know, the, you know, the mid 1900s who said, I'm a black woman, but I can start a business and I can gain customers and I can build a successful life for myself and my family. Like that is, you know, if there is any DNA part of this, it's definitely that part, right? Those, th those messages that were taught to me as a kid. Mm. Was in your memory of your mom, was she always a minister or do you remember her becoming one? Like, oh yeah, no, I remember her becoming, so she, my mom worked odd jobs. She worked at McDonald's. I think when I was born, she, she was a teenager, right? Sure. I think her first job was McDonald's. Uh, she worked as a teacher at some point, uh, you know, she, so she had, she had odd jobs here and there. She worked as a school bus driver for a long time. And then she felt this calling to become a pastor. So we, I got the chance to witness that which, you know, in hindsight, probably gave me a lot of power internally to leave science and become an entrepreneur. Her really? experience, like seeing her struggle with, okay, well, what does this mean? I'm becoming a pastor. Like, you know, that's scary. How many people are going to like, I don't, it's not like I'm inheriting this huge church of people and on, on payroll, but I feel this internal calling to do this and I'm going to do it. Right. And, you know, in essence, parallel to my experience, I'm in science. I'm doing well. You know, I'm a I'm a bright kid. I'm a future star in the in the science world or whatever you want to say. I'm, I'm I have published articles out there. And one day I just realized, hey, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm going to walk away, and I think I'm going to still be okay. Mm -hmm. I think things are going to still work out for me. Well, in in the faith of a mustard seed, you know. We don't usually talk about the spirituality of entrepreneurship. That's that'd be a cool class, though. But, you know, like you said, you know, faith in faith, you know, just that it could be, Yeah. you know, entrepreneurs, you know, and they, Steve Jobs is famously recorded for bending reality, right? Like, yeah. you know, and, and you know, they, the engineers would say, well, yeah, I'll take us six months. He goes, great. I want it in six weeks. Right. You know, and but like to to envision a world that doesn't exist. And then to put your energy against the fulfillment that it's, you know, it's a, it's a special kind of, it's a special kind of way to spend your time. It's an audacious thing, right? The audacity yeah. to believe that what you see in your head is actually possible. Yeah. And I think most, most great entrepreneurs, like that's what they're, that's what they're trading off of, right? Like that's, they're trading on that ability to see and to make happen, right? Because I mean, that's how your success in, in that world, you create a product that no one else has, you do it better, you do it faster, you do it, whatever. It's like, I can, I can do better than what I see. That pretty much is what it is, right? Like you, I have faith in my ability to do something better than what's out there in the market right now. Well, we have just a few minutes left and um, Rob had to jump off for a work call. Josh, was there any question you wanted to ask of Steven? 
Sometimes people are listening and driving, but I wanted to offer that. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Well, um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah. So I just a couple of quick ones to wrap up. Okay. You know, you're a father of four, you got two businesses. So, you know, what's a time management hack? And I think you've already embedded several, but you know, if, if, is there a, is there a new time management hack, life hack that has, you know, entered your life in the last months that is helping you juggle all this? Um, you know, well, the pandemic put a wrench in a lot of things. Um, you know, the kids went from being at school all day to being at home all day. You know, I was in my last year at Anderson. So I went from, you know, being at school Tuesday and Thursdays to being at home for those, e for those evenings. Um, and I think the compassion that I had to have for myself needed to have an increase, needed to, needed to have a boost. Mm. Right? So, um, you know, the hack, if it is a hack, is still part, you know, you got to put the work in. Mm -hmm. um, if you, you got to wake up early, wake up early. If you got to stay up late, stay up late. But it's also this sense of, I don't see my professional life as separate from my life. Um, it's, it's just all who I am, right? So with that, how do I prioritize what's important in my life? It's important to me, to me to take my kids to school every day. All right, so that means I'm not scheduling meetings that will, co that will coincide with me taking my, my kids to school every day. Mm -hmm. uh, now my wife, I'm fine, my wife picks them up, right? So I can you get that time, those hour or two with her going and picking the kids up and they go and hang out a little bit, right? So I'm just, I'm the hack for me as an entrepreneur and especially with this work at home type of scenario that we're all, or most of us are in, it's how do you integrate what you love to do versus uh, schedule, just schedule what you want to do, right? Like schedule what you, what your professional, your professional goals. Um, so I, you know, I take calls for the Emmy on capital side. I'm working with clients in, in the academic side of things as well. And I schedule that based upon how it integrates well into my, my life and my children, what they're, what they're doing. And it's hard to say that, you know, that you can start off that way. Fortunately, I'm in a position where you know, I put all the years of compounding, uh, of compounding work and I'm in a great place with clients and things like that. But with Emion, I'm, I'm the small fish in the big pond, mm -hmm. right? So I have to also temper, well, I have four kids. Can I do 10, 12, 14 hour work days right now? No, I can't. And that's okay. That's okay. If I can get 10 hours a week out of great conversations and networking and speaking to entrepreneurs and, and, and advising, that's fine, right? Because I know that's going to build on the next week. And when, when I, I promise you, when my kids are all in school and I have that time, you know, I won't be starting at zero, right? I'll, I'll, be, I'll have some foundation that's been built over the, over the years. So that's how I look at it. Really awesome. Like yeah. <laughs> Give me two seconds. I'm going to be right back. I got to get... I got to get my little my little buddy. All right, so my last three questions. Dee -dee -dee -dee. So if you if you are going to give a Bruin bear hug, you get to give three. One is to um, you know favorite professor. One is to a favorite B school new friend, and then the last one will be from your personal life. So we'll end on some appreciation for the village that helped you become you. That's a good question. Um... Well, I'll start in reverse. Obviously, you know, a big hug to personal life would be, would be my mother. Mm. Um, she's always been my biggest fan and supporter. Um, my wife as well, but I give them both a hug simultaneously. Excellent. Uh, the the friend from school. You know, you just had him on your on your on your on uh, the podcast last week. Derek Cox. He and I have become pretty close. Are working on some some awesome business plans for the future, and you know he's. A person who, again, it's like I would have never met him. I would have never met him if I were if it were not for Anderson. So I have to give him a shout out as well. And then in terms of uh, professors, really, this is a hard one. Um, hmm. So the person that stands out to me the most is uh, is Tony Bernardo. Really. Yeah, so he taught a finance class that I was in. So he he was like the guy I'm sitting there like I have no idea, but he's so brilliant <laughs> and he said it so clearly. And <laughs> I feel weird to ask the question because it seems like it was so perfectly articulated. But you know, I would go home and and or not go home and go to a Barnes and Noble out here near my house and stay up until 10, 11 o'clock at night, going over notes and trying to make sure 
you know, I got it. He made a huge impact on me because he, he showed me, like, he's such a cool guy. Um, and he, sh he showed me kind of the vessel, the caps, the encapsulation of a person who's like teaching, but he's also now the new Dean and he's so knowledgeable. And it's just, it just it seems like it just flows. Like every, all of it just kind of flows or flowed in my observation of it, at least. So he, he was most probably the most impactful person, although there's, there's, there's some other people there as well. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He's taught over 5,000 students yeah. and, and then he took over being Dean and then he got handed a big pandemic. <laughs> I mean, like heavy is the head who wears the crown. You know, it's just, it's been a, it's been a tough couple of years for anybody in a leadership position in life. Yeah. Um, but that's awesome. Okay. Awesome. Well, we can even touch on the John Wooden fellowship thing that I got. And, you know, this, you know, now that you were talking about Anderson, I'm like thinking about all these other things that all these other amazing experiences um, that happened for me there. So it's, well, yeah, let's, okay. Well, we, I mean, I mean, we, we, I, I have time. This is what I do on Fridays at lunch. Um, but you know, what was that like? Yeah, you're right. That should have been on my, you're a hard guy to interview in an hour. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Now I'm embarrassed that I forgot. Yes, yeah, so we have the John Wooden Global Leadership Award, which has been offered for the last 10 or 11 years to an outstanding executive from the world of, of corporate success. And corresponding to that are the, um, I think we offer four now, right? Four, was it, wasn't your year four? Um, you know, one, one student um, representative of the John Wooden, what, what's the name of the award? What do we call it at the student level? There's so it's so you, it's the John Wooden Global Leadership Fellowship. Fellowship, and there's typically a fully employed mm -hmm. winner, a full time executive winner, and then I think we've actually expanded to either MSBA or MFE. I think I could be wrong. Yeah, well, my year there wasn't that, but yeah, maybe exactly. okay. So, you know, we have ah, 900 FEMBAs uh one winner per year what was what was that like to be on the receiving side to get to have the interview with al osborne <laughs> get to hear his deep voice i love the way he al, al is a very wise man um and it, it just it oozes out of him he's definitely somebody who could have been on that list of most influential people on me during my during my mm. experience as well um you know the john wooden award was a dream come true Oh. It really was, you know, it really was a full circle moment for me. My mother, when I was younger, um, introduced me to UCLA basketball. This is like some of the earlier memories of even being introduced to UCLA. Knowing that UCLA existed was through really the basketball team um, and mm -hmm. seeing who Al Sindor and these guys, right? Like, you know, the old school guys. Um, so winning that award, although it wasn't through sports, which is a whole other part of my my history and playing basketball as a, as a kid and the doors academically that that opened up for me as a youngster um it had that feeling of like huh like this is this there's there's weight this is john wooden this is an iconic human one of the most iconic human beings uh in history and now i've won an award with his name on it so i really uh i remember it was actually my birthday when i found out believe it or not oh. and my wife had like surprised me and taken me down to you know, to uh, to Laguna Beach, and we're we're in the car, and, and and Al calls me, and I put him on speaker, and he tells me that I won the award. So it's a, you know, it's an ingrained moment that I will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. Yeah. Whoa, I didn't know that part of it. Yeah, so much, so much. It was on your birthday on I'm speakerphone sure. with your wife. I'm with my wife, the two of us. I got chills, Stephen. Like we're, we pulled over, and he told me that I won the award. <laughs> I got chills. I got chills. I did not know that. I'm the world's worst interviewer. I can't believe I didn't know that. That, that I've told. Um, so yeah, thank you for the opportunity to tell that story. It's it's a very meaningful moment for me. Wow. <laughs> well, now I got to circle back to Bonnie. These stories are way bigger than Femba. I love Femba, and you know we're awesome and wonderful. But you know, I think. For me, as a as a person who grew up in East Texas, you know, I, I just grew up in a small town with twenty two thousand people, not a suburb. You know, one high school, no private school. You know, just everybody went to public school. That's what we did, and 
I just, you know, I know about Texas Longhorns and Texas Aggies and Baylor Bears. And I get out here to California, I'm like, bump dee hey, hey, what's this about? You know, okay, we're Bruins, oh, that's good. Okay, well, who do we hate? Oh, we hate Trojans. Okay, good, I can grok that. And um, and what else is good? Oh, what, more Olympic athletes than most countries? Oh, that's cool. And and who? John Wooden? No, don't, no, never heard of him. <laughs> I'm like, so, you know, I'm, I'm coming up on my 20-year, I like to say, I'm coming up on my halfway mark, you okay. know, and... And to appreciate, you know, who UCLA is in society. And, you know, I know it's February and theoretically we're honoring Black History Month, but I just don't feel comfortable like that. That is really my lane. You know, I just like the success that you are just you. And, you know, melatonin, that's that's a that's that's maybe that's a wonderful conversation for a different interviewer who's more versed in that. But as a person from East Texas, where black, white was kind of what we had, no one was Hispanic in my town in the 70s. No one was Jewish. There was no one of Asian background. You know, we were just kind of a Southern little pocket of life over there. You know, and, and I think, wow, the fifth class of UCLA, you know, Harold Bunch was valedictorian. You know, the fifth class of UCLA had an African-American valedictorian. You know, that's just not where things were in East Texas in the early, you know, part of the last century. So it's, yeah, and when at the, at the, at the John Wooden Award, the one pre-COVID, when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar spoke, oh my God, he made everybody cry, talking about, you know, how John Wooden didn't look at him and say, oh my God, that kid's seven feet tall, <laughs> you know, let me say whatever he wants to hear to recruit him. He, he said, well, you know, you're going to have to keep your grades up here if you want to get playing time. And how that actually, his integrity out of the gate, that academics first, sports as a close second, but as a definite second, I, it was just, it was so touching to hear his acknowledgement of John Wooden when he was an impressionable student athlete. But but then, you know, they they were just friends forever after that. And, you know, and it was John Wooden who said, hey, you know, Skyhook will probably be an undefendable shot. And I know it's gangly and awkward, but I recommend you learn it. <laughs> and now the gentleman's the, you know, all-time point scorer in the history of the NBA. So the for me, like, I'm touched by your, you called it a full circle moment. I, 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 that's That's awesome. You know, and, and, and to, to, to start to have some sense of an appreciation for the global love that is associated with UCLA, it's, it's a tiny or maybe a lot bit humbling to really start to grok, wow, 540,000 alumni spread around the globe. You know, all those people from Asia and India who have aunts and uncles and grandparents who earn those master's degrees in STEM fields, and all those people spread across America who know that Coach Wooden was, you know, the ESPN coach of the century. And and how he, you know, if you go to any great basketball coach and you look at their coaching family tree, it always goes back to coach. And then you got a call from Al in front of your bride on your birthday to say out of 900 people, we selected you. That's, that's great, Stephen. Oh, yes, yes. Coach Wooden is, he's a huge role model for me. Um, I have his books, I share his books. <laughs> and again, it's because that we haven't touched on this part in the interview, but it's because he took something that you would not expect would be so impactful and he made it so much more, right? You. You know, you think about a, a sports coach, you think about X's and O's, draw up the plays, you know, yeah, you know, rile the guys up and get them out there on the field and, you know, win some games. But he was a mentor, mm -hmm. a life mentor, not just a sports coach, right? And that's, that's how I approach my business. When I think about how can I work with entrepreneurs, when I think about the kids that I, the students that I work with in education, it's not just let's get this, you know, let's get this great grade or this great score. Or, you know, let's, let me just write a check for your business. It's, you know, how can I, how can I be more than that for you? Mm. A, lot that, a lot of that comes from John Wood. I mean, my parents and, and, you know, my mama, my grandmother, my upbringing as well, but, you know, he was, he definitely represents a lot of that for me. Yeah. Yeah. It just, 
I mean, there are, there are several schools that have famous coaches, you know, and we have Coach Wooden, and now we have Coach Val. I heard her speak to the executive MBAs two months ago. I haven't heard her. Oh, 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 oh my God. I'd, I'd heard of her. And this was, you know, this is last fall. So, you know, the masks and everything. <laughs> I, have, I had not had the experience of bawling my eyes out with my nose running in a public <laughs> venue wearing a mask. But she flat out talks about what it was like to manage her integrity during the scandal mm -hmm. and and be a mm -hmm. student athlete first no excuse me well, i'm not going to say it quite right but person first athlete second yes. and how in the first half of career she was she was very much like out of the you know the caroli you know the eastern european win at all costs because that's how she thought you were supposed to be and in the second half of her career after some mentorship from coach you know, she really realized like I'm setting these young, she calls them girls. You know, I want these girls to win in life later. And, and this is a chapter, but it's a chapter in service of life later. And, and it just shifted her entire relationship to coaching. And when one of her girls came and said, yeah, that happened to me. And, you know, she actually said, okay, we're going to have a team meeting on this in the middle of the season. And she said, other coaches, when they heard I was doing this said, you're crazy. That is the absolute worst thing to do because that will just derail your whole season. And that was not the way she saw it. The way she saw it was this needs oxygen. This needs sunlight. This needs to be heard. And these are people first and all that other will come later. And it's just, I mean, when she says, I'm like, Oh, so, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, John Mamer, you know, one of our, senior deans he, he says you know ucla needs a good marketing firm because we we kind of act like we're a we're like you know yeah i hear that <laughs> we're state school we're we're pretty good and you know back to dean bernardo you quoted a moment ago you know he likes to say within one square mile you know we did invent the internet <laughs> you know just, just a little just a little thing you know like could we have survived this pandemic without the internet and zoom without the internet to connect the researchers to come up with a vaccine you, you know that that's a that's a that's a moment you know jackie robinson did integrate major league baseball which was as popular as football and the nba combined in its era like to get a sense of the impact of that yes yes long you know, history. yeah long history 22 years before the civil rights act you know like we need, you know, it's, it's, so it's something, you know, I guess we're just not, we're not a real braggy school. That's true. <laughs> that is true. I, I think that, um, you know, first of all, when you say that, I think about how great it is to become a part of that heritage myself, as a double Bruin, my kids, my, you know, our family is a Bruin family at this point. Yeah. Uh, so when, you know, to hear the history from you, it's, it's, it truly is amazing to be a part of that. Right. And for you to be a part of that and it, you know, sure, maybe we, we should market ourselves different. And <laughs> I don't really think there's a school that truly compares to UCLA, to be honest, and like figuring out how to like really package that in a way that makes it obvious to students who are applying to colleges as great of a name as UCLA has. I agree. It, it could be maybe packaged a little bit differently because there are some really great human beings that have gone through this school that have made huge impacts in the world at large, um, not just in within industries. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm adopted and, you know, it's great to be adopted. You know, I'm, I'll always, I'll always be an Aggie. I wear my ring, you know, Chicago. It's, you know, I think your heart chooses your undergrad. I think your brain chooses your graduate program. And, um, you know, I just didn't know about this world when I got out here and, and it's, it's humbling to get to participate. And, um, you know, I, we've gone over a little bit. We lost our guests. They had to run back to work, but that's okay. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll start to bring this to a close and, and you're one of those people, Stephen, you know, you were on my wish list for two years for a whole lot of reasons. I couldn't even remember the, <laughs> that you won the <laughs> wooden award. I, you know, was, so, you know, you're a human being who has woven a beautiful tapestry of a life with, with that love of education, with that do it now 
hard work ethic and with the humility to, to learn things that you didn't know anything about. And, you know, I, I hope that your story, um, I don't hope, I know your story will make a difference for future generations. And I'm really, really grateful that we had the chance to have this conversation today. You know, just thank you very much. Thank you so much. Same here. Very grateful. Thank you so much, Dylan.